Hi, I'm Sham. Welcome to Unseen. In this show, we will be talking to Brandon Pape of Antipodes Theatre Company, and Charlotte will be talking to Anik Khan from the Alex Theatre. Born in New Zealand, Peter Bain Hogg is well known in the film and TV production industry and is also known for producing Rockoys. Peter has had a great deal of experience in the media industry. He spent time in radio and live television. His career took a different turn in Australia where he joined the music industry and spent time working for promoters such as Bruce Coburn, Glenn Wheatley and Michael Gudinski. Susie Q spoke to him earlier. Peter, when you, um, you, you've obviously had to pitch your TV shows o o over time, so what, what go, what, what's the actual process of making a television show, getting it from the pitch to on air? Well, the most important thing is to find a broadcaster, yeah. obviously. Um, all the ideas in the world ain't going to come to nothing yeah. unless you've got a, a, a broadcaster that goes, yeah, we like that. Yeah. And um, what's happened in the last uh, 10 or 15 years is that, that the commercial broadcasters, who are the people with the big money that will pay for TV shows, are really, I think, becoming a lot more conservative. Um, and, and the reason for that is, I think, is yeah. because there's so much out there. So they have to be, they have to appeal to the greatest mass market. Yeah. Um, and that's and the cooking shows and the, the Love Islands the, uh, and, and whatever. And really the domain of, of um, commercial TV these days mm. is news, current affairs, sport and big event TV. Yeah. So that's why you've got the big reality shows. Yeah. And that's why they work. Um, most people go to um, Netflix or Stan or streamers for... Yeah. Um, of, of for uh, drama content these yeah. days and for good factual content. But I don't think that they really go to the broadcasters so much, apart yeah. from the ABC and SBS. Yes. And I think that's because nobody likes to sit and watch a, 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 um, a, a drama on TV and have it broken up with commercials. But um, True. So, so. Viewing mm, habits have changed. Yeah. So getting something up is obviously the, the biggest hurdle. Um, once it's up, it's, you know, financing it is one thing. So you've got a number of opportunities to go to, whether it's state uh, bodies or, or Screen Australia to help you with the financing of it. But of course they aren't interested in financing entertainment. Yes. They're only interested in, in financing drama and factual. Right. So, um, in terms of the, the special field that we like to work in, uh, kind of music and entertainment, it's hard to get any other funding apart from mm. um, you know, uh, funding from a sponsor, yes. potential sponsor. Yeah. But you know, if you, if you go back and look at the way that we started uh, with Rockwiz, for instance, we had an idea, mm. we had a vision for that idea, we needed to execute that idea, so we actually went with a bunch of cameras yeah. to Chapel Off Chapel and did our own pilot right. and then edited that and finessed it and made it as good as we possibly could and then started to show it around yeah. to all the broadcasters and And get it's not dead, is it, either? You still do, well, la la up until the well, plague, you were putting on different Yeah, we, 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 we cancelled um, uh, a bunch of live shows um, oh, within within weeks of, of yeah. COVID, we, we were due to do our annual uh, really really good Friday. Rock was really really good Friday yeah. at the at Hamer Hall, but yep. um, had to cancel that obviously. And um, so we don't know when we're going to be out there, and, and I don't think anybody does. And this no. is the great thing. I you know it's reading it's a thing in the weekend about yeah. um, you know, the festival circuit and and yeah. whether or not what's going to happen at, at Blues Fest next year. What's going to happen at no. Splendour. I know. You know, nobody, nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen yeah. at all. So, can you um, give some advice to someone who wasn't wanting to come up into the arts industry, be it television or music? It, what would be your fir the first step forward? What would be the first way you'd advise them to go? Would it be university? Would it Look, be? Look, there are some fantastic courses. Yeah, there's no doubts. Whether whether it's Collarts or RMIT or you know Swinburne, there yeah. are, there are uh, VCA. There are great courses in making film and television. A lot of the people that come out of those courses, um, uh, 
there there just aren't the jobs to walk into no. and i just don't think there are the jobs to walk into so uh, i think the opportunities to learn after you have learnt the basics through some kind of a course yeah the only way is to go out and do it and to offer yourself to anyone yeah. as an attachment yeah um there are plenty of attachment programs through uh creative victoria mm -hmm. uh, where you can if, if you're a, a camera assistant or you yeah. you know you're fond of looking through a camera and and, and framing things that you can get you can go out and Get like a mentorship yeah. sort of program on, on a on a program like um, Neighbours, for instance, yeah. long running uh, shows like that. Um, so there are those opportunities, but but really, if you if you want to do it, you just do it. And, and yeah. a part of the barrier to entry that has been lowered um, over the last 20, 30 years is is that you know you you can make a movie on your iPhone now, and yeah, people do. That's true. Um, so. Whereas 30 years ago, the, no. the equipment mm. to make anything cost money to hire or to buy. Yeah. And uh, uh, if you were going to do it well, I mean, it still does. If you can, if you, uh, but the benchmark that has, has just been lifted so high. I mean, mm. the, the iPhone is the equivalent of the box brownie now. Yes. And, and, and you've still got high end equipment that yeah. you've got to pay for that makes the images look mm. really good. Yeah. Um, but it's also about the quality. It's all yeah, but you, you can, know, can still have as much CGI and fanciness. But if unless it's quality, but it all comes down to story. You know, that's what I mean the delivery. The, yeah, that's the right. Acting it's the not the um, special effects. Yeah, but that's just my opinion. Well, it's it's about what the story is that you're yeah. telling, and whether or not it is you know if it's a dramatic story yes. or if it's a, a, a factual story, or if it's something that's. A music story yeah. you know i yeah. think that it, it, it's all about the story it's about capturing the story but there are just you know anybody can make anything these well, days we've, we've so there's no the, before, the barriers to entry yeah just, have made their little iphone movie and that's made more money than you know someone who's spent millions and millions so. yeah and i think that you know the the days of multi-million dollar well multi-thousand dollar budgets for music videos are yeah. kind of gone because you can make them for a lot less these yeah. days and make them look fantastic yeah you make can look there's brilliant. a lot of good post editing some, yeah. yeah there's some great you know fantastic software there's mm. some great low entry um so your advice hardware. would be just get out there and just do just it. do it you yeah. know adopt the nike philosophy and just <laughs> do it i love it mm. all right awesome thank you peter pleasure are we happy now fantastic good good fantastic. <laughs> all right well done yay Producer, director and designer Brandon Pape is the artistic director of Antipodes Theatre Company. He joins me now. Brandon, you do a lot of different things. Would you like to kind of give us a little overview of, I mean, aside from being the artistic director of Antipodes? Absolutely. Uh, so um, I'm obviously not originally from Australia. I moved here from New York City about uh, two years ago. And this was uh, after having spent about six years living in New York. And I'm originally from the Midwest. And so I uh, lived in Chicago for a little bit. So I've been sort of a bit nomadic in my career so far. Um, moved here with my Australian partner and uh, started Antipodes Theater Company, which has been around for a little over a year now. Um, we've really come a long way as a company uh it feels like an eternity ago it feels like we're already you know in our you know second or third year uh together and um yeah it's really forced us to kind of take into account not only our own trajectories as artists but how we fit in and how we want to fit in to kind of the larger community so um for me, that's meant uh, doing a lot of online workshops. Uh, I've, you know, sort of taken advantage of the fact that, you know, through, you know, we're able to have this conversation from different places. We've been able to connect with artists from all around the world. Um, as a company, we just finished a two-week retreat 
where we had originally was planned to be in-person retreat, but we had artists join us from Sydney and Perth and Brisbane, and we had as far away as um, the West Coast of the United States. So um, it really, you know, it's allowed us, there's, there's been a bit of a silver lining in terms of how we're able to adapt and how we're able to assess, um, you know, what it is that we want to be doing and saying. And so, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest lesson that has come out of this is that um, it's really allowed us to um, think in a much more meaningful way mm. about uh, the stories that we want to tell and the artists that we want to surround ourselves with. Antipodes Theatre Company ran a winter development retreat that was originally meant to be an obviously in-person event, but when the COVID crisis hit, had to convert everything into an online format. So, Brandon, what were the challenges of bringing this whole process online? Um, we... <laughs> In all aspects, everything was a challenge. But uh, we, um, I mean, we started the year going into our second, our first full season, but our second year as a company. And we postponed our productions fairly early into the pandemic. Uh, we were supposed to be doing a musical in May called Murder for Two, which was an Australian premiere. Uh, and we were also doing the Victorian premiere of a Tony Award winning play called The Humans. And it just, you know, became apparent right away that um, those were not going to be possible. And uh, very early on, the uh, my fellow committee members within the company uh, decided that we wanted to shift as much programming online as we could. And so very quickly tried to, you know, immerse ourselves in as much uh, information and training and, uh, you know, discovered what Zoom was and being able to find out what tools were at our disposal because all of a sudden we found ourselves in a very um, alien environment, but we knew that we wanted to still uh, provide opportunities to artists, stay on people's radar. I mean, we're a young company. We, we knew that we couldn't just sit back and wait until um, – an opportunity came to us. We had to make our own opportunity. We had to forge our own path. Opportunities and advantages of being online um, soon became very apparent. So, um, you know, in with the retreat in particular, um, you know, this was something that I had done a version of in the past. And, you know, some of my more memorable moments that I was hoping to bring to the retreat were things like, you know, communal meals and being able to um, sit in on another project's session or yeah. rehearsal. And um, those were obviously things uh, that we couldn't do in person in, you know, be in the same room together. And so we just tried to apply as many of, of those ideas as we could, but also figure out, you know, different ways, things that we perhaps couldn't accomplish in person, um, things like being able to work with artists from all parts of the world. Um, we also, you know, gave ourselves parameters that um, actually ended up working really well in an online form forum. Things like, uh, you know, being able to stagger people's time so that artists and collaborators were able to work one-on-one -on -one but recording sessions so that a meeting between a dramaturg and a playwright could be sent to a director to watch and be able to then apply to, you know, the next rehearsal or the next, you know, meeting that they would have with the playwright. So it was a really, um, it became, uh, it, it opened up a lot of opportunities in terms of being able to share information as well as, um, you know, document this time for um, what we called the lead artists. So we had eight projects involved, 10 lead artists among them. So two of the projects had two um, creators or writers attached and they got to walk away with, um, you know, every, you know, in some cases, all of their sessions being recorded. And, um, you know, in the case of Zoom, we were able to do some open sessions where um, they can now send these 
videos to grant applications or, you know, people that potentially might want to produce their work in the future. So in that sense, it really, you know, we, we learned that there were a ton of advantages. Of course, there were things that we couldn't do and, and, and were sort of, um, you know, considered negatives in the beginning or, or barriers in the beginning that um, just didn't really matter in the end. I think everybody walked away. Um, and so that was a really nice discovery to make that um, in terms of the retreat being focused on development, we were still able to carry out many of the fundamentals associated with that. Um, so Brandon, in our industries, is there particular companies or particular artists that inspire you creatively? M statements matter, words matter, action matters more. So um, one, a company in New York called New York Theatre Workshop has come up with what they're calling their core value statement to live alongside of a mission statement. And I think we're gonna, you know, well, yeah, steal. Uh, you steal all kinds of good ideas all the time, <laughs> but uh, learn from, yeah. listen to, learn from their example. Um, and basically, you know, the way that they explain it, if, the, if a mission statement explains um, why you exist, then a core value statement exists how, it explains how you exist. Mm, and I yeah. think um, that's something that we are certainly uh, admire, certainly admiring of and uh, hope to incorporate into our, you know, ethos moving forward. How do you feel like the theatre scene in the States and in New York specifically uh, compares to what it's like over here? Very, very different, but... <laughs> um, well, you know, it's funny because I spent seven years in Chicago, which is known for its what they call the storefront theatre scene. Um, tons of small companies, um, often with very small budgets, um, sort of a scrappy... Uh, build it and they'll come mm -hmm. mentality. Uh, New York is obviously the home of commercial theater. It's the home of Broadway. It's, uh, you know, sort of you learn a lot about things like spectacle, things like how to build, like how do you access audience? Mm -hmm. um, I worked for companies in New York uh, called the Drama League, which supports directors mostly, um, but they have a really great um, place in the ecosystem of theater where, you know, they have programming that really specifically supports individuals as well as new work. And I think that that's a really interesting place to be positioned. And so since moving here, I think, um, I mean, I would say, if anything, I think the, there's a, like, I think that storytelling that I've seen, and, and I think just uh, amongst a lot of, you know, state institutions and larger institutions that are um, focused on things like first, supporting First Nations playwrights is the, there's just a, a different kind, it's, it feels more genuine in, in terms of the way mm -hmm. that storytelling is presented. Um, it feels more um, grounded, like there's something about uh, a lot of the work that I've seen, mostly in Melbourne, but I've, I've made a few trips to Sydney, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it feels like, you know, the, um, between the artists, and the approach to storytelling um, definitely has maybe maybe more similar to kind of a uh, a sort of Chicago idea where it, it does feel like um, a very small community. It mm. feels like, you know, everyone sort of knows or knows of each other in a sense. And um, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, we, you know, we talk about this all the time of like finding our place as a company. And I think that Antipodes, you know, in addition to supporting diversity and that being kind of a main point of our mission, um, just in the name, we are hoping to take on stories that look at things from sort of 
a different perspective, antipathy meaning opposite, um, sort of in the literal meaning, it's opposite sides of the world, which is where I'm from. But, um, <laughs> you know, that idea of like being able to step into someone else's shoes. And, and so um, it's heartbreaking to see, you know, even just since I've moved here, companies like uh, Stage Art, production company, um, having sort of closed. Yeah. And uh, I think moving forward, it's, it's going to be that genuine, authentic storytelling that people are going to, that's going to resonate. Thank you so much for having a chat with me, Brandon. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry. I couldn't be there in person. All right. See you later. We are joined by Anik Khan, who is the co-founder of Zero Media and has a wealth of experience in the technical side of theatre, including stage management and lighting design. His experience spans beyond the theatre into acting schools where he worked in both Sydney and Melbourne. So welcome to the show and thank you so much for chatting with me today. Hello. It's good. Yeah, it's good to be here. We'll just start off with if you could give us a little bit of information about who you are and how you're involved in the theatre world. I guess my journey with the theatre really started on a one faithful day with a little bit of an accident where um, I was working at the acting school and I was studying acting there a little bit as well. When I was working there, uh, the lighting desk there sort of blew up, like literally everything. It just got, kind of caught on fire. And um, I, I, you know, I went in just to look at it and the tech there was just looking at the desk and staring at it, hoping it would do something. I was like, hey, let me look at it. And I started trying to fix it and then sort of, you know, I did fix it. And from there onwards, I just kept on sort of fixing problems and sort of learnt lighting, ended up getting more involved with stage management, lighting side of things, and then slowly started picking up sound and lighting design. It was a very slow progress. It was never like, you know, one day I just said, hey, I know this. But it was, you know, just constant, um, constantly fixing things at different places. I was around theatres, um, you know, and then I'm, I ended up working at the Alex Theatre in more administration side of things instead of technical. And then eventually going back to technical, working in um, theatres where I just sort of come in, fix problems and um, do lighting and sound when I can. Great. So um, what was it about the technical aspects of theatre that captured your interest? I guess be without the technical days, never a show. So that was exciting. So I was like, I want to be important, right? And uh, you know, all those actors can hang out. But if I if I'm not here, they won't be. You know, they won't be having a show. Without the lights, you won't be seen. So that was exciting. Well, that and a lot of my friends. I've got a lot of actor friends, and I've got a lot of friends who are performers, and I wanted to support them in any way I could. So pick, learning more about technical and the production side of things meant I can support them at the best of my abilities. Um, you know, and that's why I've been, you know, and also trying to always make an effort to be around people who could help me support those uh, friends as well. So I think that was probably one of my reasons to get more into the technical. And uh, as more I got into it, I started enjoying it more. And um, you know, there's no better feeling, and I'm sure you know this feeling as well, there's no better feeling than you work hard on a show and it finally goes up and you're like, yes, and you've gone through all the problems that you could possibly, and when it finally goes up, it's literally the best feeling ever. So. Yes, definitely had that experience as well. And so having worked as a stage manager and a lighting designer and also a lighting and audio technician, which of the roles did you find most fulfilling and why? Um, I'd say definitely stage manage. Well, I did more stage management on festivals. I think stage management was fun because you were a lot more in control comparison to, comparative to being a lighting designer where you have to sort of listen to people. I don't, I'm not a huge fan of that because every, you know, creative visions get, um, you know, cla there's a clash of creative visions. But I think stage manager was fun because you could sort of try to manage the show and try to keep on track. And I think I do like the urgency of the stage management. So I think that was probably my favorite role. But um, lighting design is fun as well because I always like playing around with lights and different colors and you know, sort of actually projecting emotions through uh, colors and lights. I always think that's kind of fantastic. You know, with talking about your work, 
Um, and obviously the current pandemic that we have at the moment and going back into our um, six weeks of lockdown, how has coronavirus affected you and your work? To be completely honest, coronavirus affected me more mentally than financially or any work, uh, any mm-hmm. sort of like work dropping off. And the reason, obviously, you know, I don't have any more theatre work, so there's that, but or like any rent work. Um, but I think I've been fine for now financially. I think what's what it's really done is being away from people for so long, and even now going back into this lockdown, it's just sort of, you know, it just makes you realise how much being around people is important for humans. Because, you know, just being by yourself for that previous lockdown, I was like, man, I really miss people. And I always thought I didn't, you know, I didn't appreciate people that much, but all of a sudden I'm like, damn, I, people are so important, having them around. Just, you know, just saying hi to people, just hugging someone or shaking someone's hand. As a person, you don't realize how important that is. And like, that's probably the reason why most of us are in this industry is because we liked working with people instead of working with things. If we liked working with things, we would have been some, you know, maybe working in engineering or electronics or something like that. You know, it's because we like working with people. That's why we're in this industry. And I think for us, the biggest thing is not having those people around. So I think that's what makes it really hard. So mm. that's what's been hard for me as well, just not being around those people. And I guess to take it out of the coronavirus focus, um, what inspires you or keeps you motivated with your creative endeavours? Well, I feel like the only way in life to progress as a human is to be creative or innovative, creative or innovative, because otherwise what's the point of humanity to move forward anyway? And I think this is something I was talking to someone the other day as well, and everyone talks about technology and uh, art being, you know, art being not so much in focus these days. It's like, what are you talking about? It doesn't make sense because, you know, whether you talk about technology or innovation or anything, that's always been really just been art, right? You know, it's art of innovation and creation. Um, if you don't create and if there's no culture, I guess everyone is just gonna, going to slip into existentialism. That's what's going to happen. I mean, could you imagine a life where there's no movies, no theater, no pictures, no photos, no colorful Google? I mean, what's the point of any, anything then? You know, it's just going to be a mundane black and white world that we live in. Mm. You know? So I just feel like creativity plays an important role in humanity. And for someone who you know, is very conscious of that, that humanity needs to move forward, Otherwise, we all cease to exist. I think art is super important and their creation is really important. So what advice would you be giving to young theatre makers who are looking to market their performance? I definitely say learn about marketing and, you know, learn much as you can about marketing. It's really not that hard. You know, once you start learning about it, there's YouTube tutorials for everything these days. You know, you can find YouTube tutorials for makeup and, and marketing. So might as well start learning about it. I know as a th- as a theater maker, you wear many hats. It's just one more hat. If you can wear that, you know, it's going to save you money. And once you identify, it's just another skill that you will get as well. And once you get that skill in the long run, when you're making more and more of the shows, you'll always be able to utilize that. And, and as you become bigger theater maker and you make more and more theater, you know, you can always hire a marketer, but you'll be able to question them and call them out when they present you with the budgets and the budgets are like massively blown over because, you know, uh, most people don't understand marketing. Once you do, you'll know what they're doing. And I think it's really important to just learn that. And it's not hard. It's promise you not hard. Many people try to make it hard as possible for people to understand just because it's, it's like everything, you know. If I learned it, I don't want you to know about it, but I promise you it's really easy. Mar- learning about marketing, it's, all it is is knowing who your customer is and where, how, to, how do we talk to that customer. Now that how do we talk to that customer could be Facebook or could be TikTok or could be any of those things, right? Uh, how do we talk to that person? And once you talk to them and, and sell them the show, like, hey, come see this show. And what you need to do with when you're saying, hey, come see this show, give them the reason to come see the, see the show. Um, and whatever your reason may be. I think, for, let's say, if I was putting a show on, I'd say, hey, come see this show because you could experience something that you will never experience again only once. I think that's probably the short version of the advice. I guess. Yeah. I think that's great advice, yeah. Well, that's everything that we have time for today. So thank you so much, Anik, for coming in. It was lovely to ch- chat with you.
Um, I hope you enjoyed your time being on the show and um, yeah, thank you very much. That's all we've got time for this week, everyone. If you want to contact us, send us an email at ideas at studioemedia.com.au. Thanks for watching. See you next time.